Oh, what's up? What's up, Howard? How's it going? Welcome back to Dr. Jaws Live. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, I am really exhausted, actually. <laughs> like, um, I had a really busy weekend, and uh, I got in. Hey, Roy, Roy, what's up, man? Um, like, and, and, and Howard, what's up? I think, I think, um, it cut on when I said hello, but just in case, I just want to say hello again. So, um, hope you guys are doing well. I, um, I got in really, really late last night. Uh, I was visiting family over the weekend, so I'm really, really tired, <laughs> but <laughs> hope you guys had a good weekend. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about the taupe. Uh, we've got some more stuff also to cover, so um, I put on, uh, this is a live cam of Frying Pan Tower in North Carolina, and this is actually a really cool uh, view of sand tiger sharks. So, but how how you guys doing? How, how, how was uh, your weekend? I think, yeah, I got in midnight, so, like, if I apologize in advance if I, if I sound, like, a little loopy, or if I am, <laughs> like... Um, like, uh, yeah, I'm just really tired, but we got, we got a lot of tea, um, I've got a humongous cup of peppermint tea, I'll show in a little bit, um, but, uh, yeah, uh, Taupe Shark, uh, I'm just gonna wait, because I think a couple of people are gonna be on as well, uh, more people, but, um, Taupe Shark is a really important species for conservation, uh, it's been a, uh, a species I grew up with as a kid, uh, as far as uh, Roll I probably got a cold, but I'm excited for the Taupe Shark stuff. Yes! <laughs> awesome. Yeah, sorry, well, I mean, yeah, not yes to the cold. I'm sorry. I'm, I hope, hope you feel better soon. So, lots of running around on the weekend uh, from Howard. Yeah, yeah, same here. Same here. I, I feel you. Like, I'm just like, because it's like, it, it's kind of funny. It's just like, um, I, I like, I, everybody, every, everybody in my circle has been busy as well. I, I don't know what it is about this time of year, but like everybody, oh, although I guess like, in America, taxes are due tomorrow. I don't know if that's part of it, but oh man, I don't know. But I've been I've been busy. Uh, a lot of a lot of people in my life have been busy, so um, yeah, it's been it's been a busy time. But uh, Taupe Shark is going to be a really awesome one to talk about tonight. Um, I did not actually realize it was a critically endangered change of season. Yeah, like um, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but like I. February and March are not are no bueno for me. They're they're not my favorite. They're my least favorite time of year. Um, so it's like once we ramp up, like I'm really liking April right now, um, and like once we ramp up like through the summer and the winter, like I like that. But February and March, I'm like yeah. So, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, Taupe shark, really important shark to talk about for conservation. Um, when I was a kid, uh, like like a little kid, uh, like in the 90s, I, that was like probably one of the biggest sharks. Um, like we talk, like like that was kind of on the radar for shark conservation. It's kind of been a poster child of shark conservation. So uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I, I'm s I, I'm sort of on the fence about my music choice tonight. I picked Sid Meier's Pirates, which is an awesome game, but uh, it's a little rompy for my taste. But we'll see. We'll hopefully it'll be nice. So before we get started, we've got some interesting interesting things to talk about. This is going to be a really interesting start to the stream. Um, so, and we're starting a new tradition. <laughs> so, uh, my friends, um, I, I have some friends who really love animation, and we have like a lot of movie nights together, and um, just discussing animation, and uh, in particular we're big Disney fans, we like Disney animation, so. Um, they gave me this ridiculous <laughs> Mr. Toad mug. <laughs> Um, they went to Disney World and they brought this back, and it's this absolutely absurd, enormous, st stupid looking... I mean, I love it, but it's a Mr. Toad mug. And the tradition is, we're gonna bring this out whenever there's, uh, tea, like, drama to talk about. Uh, as in, like, shark drama, or, like, YouTube drama, or stuff like that. And I actually don't really have drama drama, but I do have something that this is gonna be an interesting night to talk about. Um, so I had, I had some interesting interactions this past week. So the new tradition is, if this mug appears, uh, there's something going on, and and we should we should talk about it. So, um, and tonight's a really good night to start the tradition because like I, I I don't have like draw <laughs> spill the tea, <laughs> for sure for sure. So the nice thing is it this is a good night to start this tradition because it's like I I, I don't have <laughs> thanks guys. I'm glad I'm glad you like Mr. Toad. Also if. This movie is actually kind of hilarious. Uh, it, this one's from the 40s. But it's like uh, 
uh, Ichabod, it's the Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, but like this character is actually a maniac and it's a lot of fun to watch, so. But anyway, so this is a good night to premiere this tradition because um, I fortunately don't have like horrible drama, like weirdness going on, but I, I have an interesting situation on one of my videos that I think it's a, it's a really good poster uh, precedent or a really good platform to talk about like bigger concepts in YouTube um, in general. Um, as, you know, as we as we keep going forward, um, you know, I think it's a good opportunity to set some precedents. So, um, so on my Sharks of the Chesapeake video, um, there is there's been a lot of discussion about white sharks possibly entering the Chesapeake Bay, and there's a lot of commenters who are very interested in this idea, but it's never happened. Um, it's never been documented. We've never seen white sharks in Chesapeake Bay. And I'm engaging in discussion uh, in like one comment thread in particular because um, it's a subject I'm pretty passionate about. And everything's been fine. Everything's been really civil and everything. But um, it kind of made me think about uh, just like future comments and future precedents and kind of like why the situation is happening. So, um, and it's, it's actually, it's a lot to unpack. So bear with me as I kind of like <laughs> process this. So, um, and one moment, sorry. Because uh, it touches on it, 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 it touches on like a lot of different things. So, um, so firstly, before I say anything, and before I, um, bull sharks maybe yeah for sure bull sharks do enter the Chesapeake Bay for sure. Um, and a good call, good call, Howard, because like they they definitely are here. They're here in the summer, um, June through September is their season. Um, they don't go all the way to the freshwater systems um like like all the way up but they have been found in like oligohaline water um like as in like, like brackish water they've been found in they, they really love to be at the mouth of the potomac river that's a big spot for bull sharks so um in the chesapeake bay so they're not super super common but they are here so that that's a good call that is a species that enters the bay so but um before i dive in any further um if uh the if Anybody who's making those comments in the Sharks of Chesapeake video, um, like if you're watching this, I just want to say like, you're we're totally cool. Like I don't have any animosity or anything. I don't feel like weird or anything. Um, I just I just you know it's it's if I ever talk about or like make a comment on shark subjects, it's always going to be targeted at the information itself. It's never the person. So we're cool. I just want to say that you know just as a precedent. So, um, but anyway, so the the. I'm getting into this interesting discussion um, with somebody about the white shark thing, and like I, when I dug into it, I can kind of see why people are making these comments uh, for a couple reasons. So, and one of them, interestingly enough, is O Search. So, um, have you guys heard of O Search? Like, like they're pretty, they're pretty famous. Like the shark tagging people. Um, like, like uh, they, they. Uh, they're on National Geographic quite a bit, where they fish for white sharks and they like they haul them out of the water and they put these satellite tags on them. Um, I'm taking another sip. I'm, I'm going to take a sip of tea as I talk about this, but <laughs> um, but like Osir, o Osir is pretty famous. Yeah, um, uh, um, yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, th 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 thanks, Roy. Because like yeah, they they they're pretty famous. They gained a lot of notoriety. I want to say like the 2010s, and um, they built a pretty big platform. Um, they are controversial in the shark world, um, and and controversial controversial is the right word for it in a sense. There's there's many people who support them, and many people who levy arguments against O Search um, in terms of their tagging practices. Um, and it's interesting, like, like there's, um, there's a lot of data that does come from O-Search, and there's a lot of data that, uh, I mean, like, like, you know, valuable data about the patterns of these animals, but, um, most of their arguments are focused on, like, how's the white shark doing, like, if you haul down the water, the weight of that animal is, like, crushing it, and, you know, it's just, like, yeah, yeah, th thanks, th thanks, Roy, yeah, like, like, um, cause it's, it is, uh, there's been, I, whenever I hear arguments uh, kind of criticizing you no know, search, like I'm, I'm pretty, they make sense to me, you know, in terms of like, are the tags invasive? Um, you know, is it really like the best? Like, like, is this, 
negatively impacting the animal's health. I kind of agree with arguments against them in that sense. Um, and I also do agree that some of the data that they provide is valuable. So, so controversy is the right word. It's, it's like, there's, there's, I think there's good arguments on both sides. So, but one thing in particular um, that has been kind of like grinding my gears a little bit is um, they've had, as far as I know, two false pings in the Chesapeake Bay like they've tagged a white shark and it's pinged in the Chesapeake Bay and then O-Search has owned up to those are false pings and they've retracted them. Um, so the pings are not available um, on the O-Search website anymore because they were not accurate. Um, the most egregious one I've seen is in Baltimore and it's like, there's no way, there's no way. Like it can't handle that low salinity. Um, so there's, there's no way. And they, they actually pulled that pin, ping back. But what happens is, like, when those pings happen, local media, like, who doesn't know anything about sharks, like, latches onto it, and they make a news story because it's a very nice puff piece. Like, oh my god, there's a shark in the bay, there's a shark in Baltimore, there's a shark in... Like, like they'll, they'll publish it, and then, you know, without really understanding that, like, the ping actually is not correct. And the reason by the ping being not correct is, like, you know, it, it, it just there's something wrong with like it communicating with the satellite there's something wrong with like the coordinates or something like they've had false pings that they've retracted but unfortunately those false pings have shown up on the app or they've been reported in local news and then that starts to kind of build up and there's now this misinformation that those that species can go into the bay when it really actually truly can't um so so that dynamic is kind of happening, and um, there's been multiple people I've run into um, that have like you know asserted that white sharks enter the bay, and I think it's kind of coming from that information, and I have to push back and say like no, they they can't do that, you know, like they 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 they've never been seen here. So um, and then uh, so there's that part of it. Um, the other part of it is. Uh, like uh, <laughs> there's a, there's a lot there's a lot of I, pr I promise we're talking about taupe, taupe sharks uh, I won't I won't spend too much time on this but there, there's there's a lot of interesting intersections uh, or like things that this intersects with so um, the other part is um, the uh, so Vim's uh, the Virginia Two Marine Science has done their shark research survey for about 50 years like half a century worth of data where they go out every year um, and they do their sampling and they study sharks at Chesapeake Bay. They've built a pretty robust data set. Um, and they've totally caught great whites off the coast. Like they've totally caught great whites in Virginia Beach. They've totally caught them like, I mean like off the coast, it's like full seawater, but they've never caught one inside the bay. And you know, they built up this really great data set of like we have 12 species in the Chesapeake. We have four species that are like maybes in the Chesapeake, the four being tiger shark, uh, lemon shark, um, uh, who are they, black tip shark, and nurse shark. Those are the four species that could maybe go into the bay. Um, but, uh, for, uh, but, but for the most part, it's usually 12 species. I, I, let me see if I could like, um, like uh, hold on. The official list of the 12 species in the bay, I wonder if I could do it mentally, is like bull shark, dusky smooth hound, uh, sand devil, pike dogfish, basking shark, really rare, but it happens, sand tiger, dusky shark, sandbar shark, Atlantic sharp nose shark, uh, smooth hammerhead, scalloped hammerhead, and there's one more. Oh gosh, who is this? There's one more, I'm um, missing it. Bonnethead, bonnethead shark. Bonnethead sharks go into the bay. So 12 species that are the official list of sharks that can enter the bay, four maybes that have had one record in history, but it's, it's not really likely. And nowhere on any of those lists are white sharks. Um, nowhere in verifiable fishing records are white sharks. Uh, there's been no documented evidence of white sharks inside the bay. So that's the information that I'm working with. And if, you know, if there's a verifiable record, I am totally open to you know, accepting that, but it doesn't exist. And it's an interesting position to be in where it's like, I have to, you know, like, I have to like argue that like, yeah, I mean, like, like we've got this beautiful, unique ecosystem and white sharks aren't a part of it. And I, I, you know, like, like I want them to be here. Like that'll be really cool, but they're just not here. And I have to like be very careful because it's like, 
when you're online, you, you got to be careful how you type things, and you got to be careful that like your online voice is very civil, and like you, you don't want to like talk down to somebody. You know, and especially that's not how I feel. Like I don't ever feel like I'm talking down to someone, but. Um, but it's been interesting kind of like navigating this where it's like I, I want to be careful and I want to be respectful But I also want to be like firm in the sense like it, it, it hasn't been documented and it's like You know, that's that's science. It's it's or it's like that's the truth. It's just it just hasn't happened So it's been interesting to kind of like think about uh, over the past um, Like I've been I've been running into these interactions more this past week and it's been interesting to kind of think about um, so um, in terms of like how you navigate that so which has led me to an interesting thing that uh, like a precedent that I, I want to set right now um, if I ever see a comment that's like crazy or like um, like trolling or vitriolic or something I won't engage and like I, I, won't, I won't talk about that at all because it's not gonna like go anywhere if I see a comment that is like you know maybe not correct but uh, you know, I think it's worth discussing. I'll, I'll definitely engage with that. So, but I just want to like set that precedent. Um, and I have more to say, and I can't remember what I was going to say. Um, I think, I think, like, I, I think what's kind of striking me is like it's, it's interesting, like how easy, I guess, misinformation can happen because I think this is coming from the Osearch pings and news stories reporting on the Osearch pings when they're actually really not founded on something. Um, and similarly, uh, I run into this also with Megalodon, like where like I've had people ask me where Megalodon is, and um, if Osearch has backed off of that claim, I, I would think that further collaboration would be required. Yeah, like like um, <laughs> yeah, I mean like they they've totally backed off of um, the 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 white shark ping thing. Um, so it's just like you know you need. Like, like I agree, you need more evidence, like in terms of like if there is a, like if there's a news story with a photo taken at a beach that is definitely in the Chesapeake, then that that counts. Like I'm cool with that. Or if if like Vim's found something or there's a v verifiable record, like like if it's a verifiable record, that's really that's perfectly fine. It's just, um, you know, if if it's not based on something though, like if if it's not, it's just. Uh, I don't know, like, I, I can't, like, I, I can't, yeah, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I just, like, 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 it has to be based on something is what I'm trying to say, it has to be, like, corroborated, and, like, yeah, <laughs> thanks, guys, I, I just saw your comments on Megalodon, yeah, I've, I've, Megalodon is one of the biggest things I've run into in terms of, like, people not getting it correct, um, I've had multiple people at book signings or comments, uh, talk about Megalodon and be like, where is it? What canyon does it live in? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I have to very, you know, carefully explain, no, it, it doesn't exist anymore. It used to exist. It's, it's amazing that it used to exist, you know, but it, it, it isn't here anymore, you know, and we've never found it and we can't find it because, well, I mean, it doesn't exist. Um, it's a enormous predator of whales <laughs> and it's like, like, you know, you'd think we've run into it by now. You know what I mean? Like, like, like it, it, it it's, 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 it's wild. So, but this is this is a thing that, that is kind of fascinating that I want to talk about more. Is like, um, because it's like as as a teacher, you have to engage with people in terms of like if they're wrong about something, but if they're willing to learn, you definitely have to engage, and and you also have to be very respectful in terms of like you have to be very. I think it's easy for people to be um, condescending in how they explain something, or it's easy for people to be like um, judgmental if if the other person has something wrong, if they don't have all the information right. Um, not one fresh. That's a good point, Howard. Not one fresh tooth. I should use that. <laughs> that's a good point. That's like I don't know why I never thought about that before. That's a good point. Not one fresh tooth. There's no white Megalodon tooth. That's a good point. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hey, che cheers, Howard. Cheers to that. That made my night. That was awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's craziness. So, <laughs> but um, what I was saying is like, um, I have to be like, and all teachers, all teachers, I mean, I'm, I'm not like a teacher teacher, but like all, all people who are like talking about science, um, there's a responsibility where it's like, you know, you have to, 
not only share correct information, but you also have to be respectful as you share correct information, you know, because it's like there's some people who simply don't have have it right. And, you know, it's part of the human experience to learn and grow. And, you know, um, I think it's Aristotle who said the wisest person is the person who can admit when he's wrong, you know. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like, that's, that's kind of like, it's, it's part of our humanity where it's like, it's important to like learn and grow. And, um, if somebody's willing, if someone is wrong, but willing to learn, it's important as any kind of educator to engage with them and, and definitely maintain like, like, you know, just a respect for that individual, you know, cause I, I think it's very easy for people to be dismissive, especially online. I think it's very easy to, for people to be dismissive. So um, so it, for, for anything I say or any, any of my comments, um, you know, I, I just, I'm very, very mindful. Like I never want to dismiss somebody who might not be correct on something. Um, because like I care about, you know, just the truth and like, I, I care about sharing it, like literally sharing it with, with people. So, um, and it's also a tricky balance because like, I don't have as much patience for craziness, you know, <laughs> like, like, like if someone is telling me something completely insane, I can't engage with it. Like. I don't know, like sharks on the moon or something. It's like no, I can't. I can't. I, I, have, I, have, I have no time. Like, like so. Um, and if the megalodon was still around, boats would have been chipped at. Yeah, and we see much more like seeing often like seeing basking sharks. Yes, for sure. Or sea whales. Hey, Anya, what's up, Anya? Or sea whales with chunks taken out of them. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. You know. Um, being online can feel like a snake pick in Indiana Jones sometimes. For sure. Like, yeah, that's that's the tricky part is, is like, um, and, and and that's why I definitely want to take this opportunity to talk about this, this scenario where, um, for the most part, if it's something that is like, there, there's no reason to be aggressive and there's no reason for people to be toxic. So if, it, if it's something that's toxic or trolling, like, I won't engage. Like, I, I, I'm absolutely not going to engage if there's something that's, like, mean-spirited or toxic or trolling. I can't. I, I'm not doing it. Because it's, like, it doesn't go anywhere, and I don't think that person genuinely wants to have a discussion. But if it's something where it's, like, you know, someone might be passionate about a subject, and but but they, they genuinely seem like they care, and they're maybe not correct, I, I do want to engage in those scenarios. So, um, but, but yeah, um... And I also, like, I, I thought it was important to talk about it tonight, right now, because it's like, I mean, you can hear me and you can see me, and it's, it's like, it's very easy to miscommunicate, like, when you're typing, um, how you feel. And, like, how I feel, especially for this specific discussion, um, is, like, I don't have any animosity towards a person. I, I just care about, like, drilling down on the facts and, like, what's real and, and, you know, can you verify this and, you know, so... Um, I had something else to say in relation to this, and I totally forgot what it was. Um, like, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I thought I had one more point, yeah. Yeah, trolls lack any reasonability, so I completely understand, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so official precedents, I'll, I'll just cheers to this and drink out of this. I will not engage with trolls ever, like, like, I, I can't, and just, especially preserving, like, a, we have a really nice community, and I just want to make, continue to, you know, um, like, cultivate our nice community like we're all, we're really awesome and like i'm i mean we're welcoming um for everybody so it's just like you know like if if, if there's any troll comments i'll probably delete them and yeah i won't engage with them at all really so i'm just gonna set that precedent here on out um you know just official stance but if there's if there's um what is your book <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh so anya so, some friends of mine got this for me a while ago and we're, we're setting up a, this is a new tradition. If there's drama or tea, this is the, this is the mug of tea. If I ever run into something in, in Dr. Jaw's world that is like actual drama, it, this is the mug that's gonna appear. So this is Mr. Toad from, um, from Disney, from Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, so. <laughs> it's the Mr. Toad teacup. <laughs> oh man. Um. Oh, man, I thought I had something else. Uh, da, 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 yeah, it's tricky too. Like, um, I don't take any difference in opinion personally. Yeah, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 tricky. Um, it's tricky. It's tricky to navigate because, um, for example, I, I was thinking about this too. Like, when it comes to something like O Search or Discovery, um, like. I have mixed feelings and some of the feelings are positive and some of the feelings are negative. 
and uh, and I also have responsibility as far as like um, you know our community like 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 I always want to be truthful or not want to be but like I always will be truthful and you know like say I had an opportunity to like collaborate with Osearch or say I had an opportunity to collaborate with Discovery or something you know it, it's like I, you have to preserve that integrity in terms of like I don't ever want I will never engage in like nonsense you know but like i do i do like i don't also like it's like 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 i think a lot of people like kind of compromise you know in the interest of like expanding their platform and stuff and like i just you know i i'm, I'm just like i'm all about like the truth you know in, ter in terms of like you gotta you can't be a sellout man <laughs> like you gotta you gotta like like especially when it comes to science and nature you have to you have to make sure like you maintain an integrity um i i, I don't know i don't think i'm really making a lot of sense but like i just I don't know. That, that's kind of where my head is at in terms of, like, just... The most important thing is, like, we cultivate, like, a community of, like, positivity, but then also accuracy, you know, in terms of when we talk about, like, shark science and stuff. So, cheers to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's everything I had to say on that subject. Um, I'm just reviewing, just making sure I got everything, or I said everything I wanted to say. Da -da 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 -da. I think that was it. I think that was it. Okay. I think without further ado, we should probably go into the tip shark. So, <laughs> cheers, guys. So, uh, let's... There's actually a couple cool videos on YouTube. Um, da, 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 da. I think this one was actually kind of cool. So, okay, here we go. So, Tope Shark, Galeorhinus Galeus. This, this is... Uh, I said it at the top of the video, but this is an extremely important species. Um, this is like, uh, when I was growing up, the textbook species for conservation. As far as like, this is the textbook overfished shark. This is the textbook shark that, um, oh, there he is. Look at that. Uh, textbook shark uh, for, um, you know, over harvesting uh, for commercial use. Like, um, it's also known as the soup fin shark um, or the school shark. Look at that, it's so cool. Um, what's cool is that this is a triacid, so it's a hound shark. Uh, it's similar to dusky smooth hounds, but you can kind of tell uh, the body plan is a bit more robust than dusky smooth hounds. So let me uh, go ahead and read from the great book, uh, Galerians Galeus. So, and I think, is this the only, this is the only shark of its genus, Galerinus. So this is an active, strong swimmer capable of traveling 35 miles per day. Uh, populations in higher latitudes make long distance migrations between their winter and summer feeding and breeding grounds up to 14 kilometers in the southwest Atlantic. Uh, other populations migrate shorter distances seasonally, inshore and offshore. This species also makes vertical diurnal movements from deep water by day to shallower water at night. That's actually really cool. A lot of sharks do that. A lot of sharks like to be in deep water during the daytime and then um, they'll go into shallow water at night. Um, a lot of predatory sharks do that. Um, like, uh, which is like, that's part of the reason why you should not be swimming at night, um, like near beaches, because like sharks are patrolling the, those shallower waters. Like like that old uh, adage, adage, like don't swim at night uh, in order to avoid a shark attack. That's part of the reason like a lot of sharks are more active in shallow water at night. So. Um, although generally considered to be a species on a continental shelf, tag returns have identified long oceanic journeys across the Tasman Sea, uh, Tasman sea from Australia to New Zealand, uh, particularly females, and over uh, 2,500 kilometers from the UK to the Canary Islands, also to the Mediterranean, Azores, Norway, and north of Iceland. Interesting. Oh, this is cool. Uh, genetic studies indicate that the Pacific Ocean is a barrier to their migration but there's a high connectivity between populations in South Africa and Australia. Uh, by the way, uh, this is, this shark is, I think it's actually not called a taupe shark. I think they just call it taupe. Like, like that's the, the official English name is just taupe. Like, that's it. Like, the, it, it's not necessarily called taupe shark. Um, like, sand tigers sometimes are referred to that way too, where it's like, it's not sand tiger shark, you just call it sand tiger. So, I don't know, it's kind of fascinating, but, um, let's see, let's rewind so we can get some more taupe shark footage. Um, taupe usually occur in small schools, uh, partially segregated by size and sex, uh, so it's something common to sharks uh, all around. 
Do, 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 do. Uh, juveniles remain in nursery grounds for up to two years, but may move into deeper water in winter, then join schools of immature animals elsewhere. Let's see, this is a viviparous species, so live birth with yolk sac. Uh, maximum age is possibly 60 years. That's crazy. So this could... Wow. This shark can possibly be 60 years old. Uh, the species is mainly opportunistic feeder on bony fish and invertebrates. Uh, predators include other large sharks and uh, probably marine mammals. Do, 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 do. Okay, so uh, status is critically endangered globally due to depletion in unmanaged target uh, gillnet and long line fisheries. Uh, bycatch and damage to inshore nursery ground habitat are also a concern. Do, 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 do. It's critically endangered in the southwest Atlantic. Um, it's endangered in Europe. Um, it's actually listed uh, under uh, Canada's Species Act, or no, sorry, Canada's Species at Risk Act. So uh, depletion in Northeast Pacific has resulted in being listed under Canada's Species at Risk Act. So wow. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, G, uh, so this species uh, probably has more vernacular names than any other shark because it has been targeted by so many fisheries in different localities for its meat. Um, and, like, which is popular in many parts of the world. Uh, and liver oil, so that's why it's sometimes called the oil shark, or the vitamin shark, or the soup fin shark. Okay. Uh, this species is listed on Appendix 2 of the Conservation for Migratory Species, or CMS. So. Um, interesting. I did I did pull up CMS because uh, that that's a really important listing. So we'll take a look at that later. But um, it's wild it's wild seeing these guys uh, kind of in open water. Uh, they remind me of um, there's a lot of cool dive videos of uh, uh, pike dogfish in uh, Norway. I, the, Norway is a great place to dive uh, with um, uh, squalls of campheus. So. Uh, so this kind of school behavior reminds me of that, but um, I was reading from the book, so I didn't get a good uh, chance to look at the video, but um, these are really cool. Like, uh, again, they do look a little bit more robust than smooth hounds, like the muscleless genus. I mean, I mean, this is a smooth hound. It is a kind of smooth hound, but um, the body plan looks a little bit more robust, a little bit sharper features, which is really cool. I wonder what it's uh, swimming with. And how many individuals are here? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, 10, 20, 30, maybe three, 40. Oh my gosh, this, this is like, so this is, um, I think this video was in the Azores, which I would love to go someday. Um, but that's a really fascinating area because that is at the convergence of three continental plates. Um, the North American plate, the African plate, and the European plate all converge. And um, that like, like that's made the, the island chain um, that is the Azores. Uh, that zone is also called the Triple Junction Zone. So it's a really cool part of the Atlantic Ocean. And it's really awesome seeing a video of these sharks in this area. So... <laughs> And they're really, they're really pretty. Like, um, I, I, I like, like, they, they almost kind of look like a classic shark, like a kind of like a new, like, like a more narrow, um, slim version of like that very classic shark build. Like, you know, just a, a plain gray coloration. It's, 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 it's kind of, it's, I don't know, I, I like it. I dig it. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty close, um, I like the shark got right up into the camera, so. I wonder um, what the jaw set is gonna look like uh, for these species, cause the muscleless, uh, muscleless canis has like those flat pavement-like teeth. So it's gonna be really cool to see um, what the jaws look like for uh, this shark. So I'm just gonna um, ch take a look at the comments, so. It's like a smooth hound with a lot more carcarinid features. Yeah, for sure. I, 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 they have a distinct Z pattern on their sides. Ooh, wait, let me go back to that. Good call. Wait, let me, let me check that out. I think I see it. Oh, that's really cool. 
I think I see it, like this this kind of like faded area. That's actually really, really cool. That, that is an interesting coloration. That kind of reminds me of um, like cetaceans a little bit, like like dol like like some dolphins have like s that similar like kind of, I forget what that's called. It's not a cape, is it? I forget what that's called as far as like a body pattern. This is an, I see, yeah, that's actually really cool. Good call. Don't, don't, I think orcas have this kind of thing, right? Like, um, on their belly? That's really cool. Uh, let me check the comments. So, uh, in French, sand tigers are called requin top taupe shark. Oh, never mind. It's called that way back. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was just catching up with the comments. Yeah, it does make them look really sleek. Like, it's, 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 it's a really cool, really cool coloration. Um, and I also love, like, uh, I think, uh, Roy Roy, uh, like, like, I, I'm noticing that too, just kind of like, uh, the, the upper caudal fin, um, uh, having that really big, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, the upper caudal lobe. It, it that does remind me of Requiem sharks mo more. You know, like like right here, like that's that's pretty developed. And like uh, even like the dorsal fin and like the lower caudal fin, it's a bit sharper. Cause like in Musculus, um, the lower caudal, I don't think it's a, it's as big. You know, um, so in this shark, it definitely looks like like it looks more robust. So that's a that's a good eye uh, saying that it kind of looks like more more like some certain carker I did. So that's that's actually really cool. Um, I am very curious about the names, so let's go into, uh, I think Fishbase, Fishbase has the Latin names, so, so the actual Latin name, uh, Galerinus, Galio is based on Galius, uh, see below, and Rhinus, ancient names for shark from Rhine? Wait a minute, what? Wait a minute. Okay, this is so strange. I thought rhinus is like nose, like rhinoceros or rhinoptera. Like I thought rhinus means nose. An ancient name for sharks from Rhine, rasp alluding to a rasp-like skin. And Galeus from Galeus, a small shark or dogfish per Aristotle. Sometimes translated as weasel, possibly referring to the pointed snouts, swift movements, and a rapacious feeding behavior of smaller predatory sharks. So what's funny is that <laughs> One way to translate this, Galeorhinus Galeus, is shark, shark, shark. Like, Galeo is shark, Rhinus is shark, Galeus is shark. So, the shark, shark, shark is one way to translate it. But I guess the better way to translate it is the um, weasel, shark, weasel, or the weaselly weasel shark. <laughs> I kind of like, I kind of like the weaselly weasel shark is, is one translation. Um, I don't know how accurate this is about Rhinus because I'm really uh, really certain that Rhinus means I mean you know word roots can have multiple meanings so but like Rhinus is like like um, like 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 Carcharhinus you know there's a Rhinus in there and that means nose you know so like I kind of feel like Gaily Rhinus means sh Weasley shark nose I don't know like I don't know I like the Weasley Weasel Shark as a literal Latin translation. That's that's gonna be the one I, I, I uh, <laughs> I'm gonna stick with. So, yeah, it's literally called the Shark Shark Shark. <laughs> yeah, it's just a shark. Yeah, Shark Shark Shark, like Shark Shark Shark, or the Weasley Weasel Shark. That that is the thing that I would like to to translate that as. But for English names, um, I think Florida Museum of Natural History they usually have good English. Oh, here we go. Yeah, they usually have a good list. So here we go. All right, so we got the taupe shark, eastern school shark, the flake, the gray boy, oh, I like that, the gray shark, Penny's dog, the schnapper shark, I like that, these are great names, oh my gosh, the school shark, the sharpie shark, I like sharpie shark, the soup fin shark, the sweet William shark, where did these come from? The taupe oil shark, the taupe school shark, the taupe soup fin shark, and vitamin shark. That's craziness. That is actually amazing. How many link? Like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, oh, sorry, 13, 14, that's 14 English names. That's crazy. What, what, what do you guys, your, what's your favorite names? Uh, like, what's your favorite English names for this? Because that, 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 that was a bunch. bunch. Like, like, uh, I see, uh, I see Grey Boy, Boy from, from uh, uh, Roy Roy. Shark, shark, shark. shark. Uh, oh, um, yeah, so, oh, yeah, so, uh, uh, so, 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 uh, so,
so Parka, Parka, so Parka, 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 so, so I think Carcharinus Carcharinus translates as sharp, 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 sharp nose, nose or sharp nose. sharp nose. Um, so that's um, where so I'm getting that from because I'm pretty sure Carca means sharp. Like sharp. like, like Carca Don means shark tooth, but, but I think it can also be translated as sharp tooth, which is really it's tricky. But Carcharius means shark. Carcharius means shark. Um, so I don't know. Like what's weird is like with scientific names, they draw from both Latin and Greek. And so it's it's gonna be like there could be multiple multiple translations and multiple meanings. So um, <laughs> let's see, uh, Penny's dog, uh, the Nat Natal shy shark is also called the Sweet William. Oh, oh, shy sharks are really cool. Actually, let's let's um, pull that up. Actually, these are really cool. All oh, right, shy sharks. I think they're a kind of swell shark, if I have that right. Like uh, the most famous one I know of is the puff. Oh, this is why they're called shy sharks. Is because as part of a defense mechanism, um, they do hide their faces and their tails. Like they curl up like this. Uh, that's part of why they get the name shy shark. It's actually really adorable. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, puff, uh, puff Adder Shy Shark is the one. Yep, look at that. Yeah, it's like hiding under its little tail. This is so cute. That's actually really adorable. We might we might need to uh, cover Shy Sharks next week. That's actually very, very... Uh, good call, Anya. Yeah, yeah see, that's, that's actually extremely adorable. That is, that is maybe the cutest shark. Poor Jackson Shark has been winning as far as our cutest shark competition not that there's a competition but that's really cute that's actually really cute uh we might have to do shy sharks next week because uh yeah that's extremely cute <laughs> all right sorry top shark so good call on you um <laughs> howard like snapper i like snapper as well um they're all great except the food names i agree um as far as top shark goes um this is really hard for me to pick like Snapper, Sharpie, Gray Boy. Um, I I do like Tope, but like Snapper, Sharpie, and Gray Boy are probably my favorite. Um, like like those those are probably my favorite. Uh, I I can't, yeah yeah those are probably my favorite so of the English names. So oh man, um, I don't even know what to go from here. Like. Uh, I guess while we're on, we definitely have to we definitely have to check IUCN red list because this is again this is a critically endangered species. This is um, yeah actually let's dive into that right now because this is critically endangered. So this is this is the worst status for sharks. Uh, so we should probably do that first. So um, firstly, let's double check where this is in the world. So it's on the Canadian Pacific coast, the American uh, Pacific coast as well. Uh, and the, well, the Pacific, uh, Canada, the United States, and Mexico, it's in the Pacific. Um, I don't have them here in my part of the world, but they are found in Iceland. This is such a unique distribution. They're found... It's interesting that they're here, but not on my coast, and then they're in the Pacific. But then again, maybe that makes sense, because it's like... They... You can find them in South Africa, you can find them in South America. Yeah, I mean, I guess... I guess I guess they don't like it there, I don't know why. But um, Iceland, United Kingdom, Northern, oh, all around Europe, pretty much. Uh, Mediterranean, Australia, New Zealand. So, it's interesting species. Not, not in the Indian Ocean, not in the Western North Atlantic, not in the Caribbean. So, interesting. Uh, Triacidae, so same, again, same family as Mussels canis, uh, Galeorhinus. Uh, this is the only shark in the Galeorhinus genus. Um, and we need to check the assessment information in detail because this, this again, this is like the poster child for sharks. So I won't read the whole thing out loud, but I'll just scan this. So, um, do, 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 do. anthropologic shark. Do, 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 do. Uh, occurs on the continental shelves and upper to mid slopes from shallow inshore to well offshore to depths of 826 meters, though most frequently to depths of 200 meters. 
Oh, genetic and tagging data support up to six separate subpopulations of taupe, while the species makes extensive movements within each of the subpopulations. Uh, there's no evidence of mixing between them. Interesting. So, fragmented populations. Um, taupe has a particularly low biological productivity with a late age at maturity and triennial reproductive cycle. Um, so that's kind of like dusky sharks have that too. It is caught globally as target and bycatch in industrial and small scale dorsal and pelagic gillnet and longline fisheries, and to a lesser extent in trawl and hook and line fisheries. Um, uh, taupe is often retained from the meat and fins, but is discarded or released in some areas in line with regional management measures. Steep subpopulation stock reductions of over 80% over the past few generation links, 79 years, have occurred in the southwest Atlantic, uh, southern Africa, and Australia. Uh, Northeast Atlantic uh, subpopulations have estimated to have undergone a reduction of 76% over the past few generation lengths. In the Northeast Pacific, a dramatic decline in subpopulation occurred in the early 1940s with no recovery until 1997-2004 when localized management led to a localized increase in abundance. The consistent steep subpopulation reductions across most of the analyzed subpopulations and stocks together with the lack of movement between the subpopulations are cause for serious concern. Okay, management in Australia, uh, thank you Australia, uh, probably aided by the immigration of large mature animals from New Zealand, appears to have stabilized this, that stock since 2000. So that's 23 years, that's good. Um, shout out to Australia, by the way. Um, I, Australia has a lot of great shark science. A lot uh, of awesome uh, research is done in Australia, and uh, just shout out to Australia for being awesome when it comes to sharks. So, uh, the subpopulation in Northeast Atlantic has been stable in recent years, possibly due to management measures, and there's some recovery in part of the Northeast Pacific. Uh, release of this species is mandatory since 2011 off Canada. Shout out to Canada. Thank you guys for. Um, being awesome and um, imposing a mandatory release on taupe, uh, taupe sharks. Like, that's 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 awesome. Uh, release is mandatory in European Union. Waters for line caught taupe. The global population is estimated to have undergone a reduction of 88%, with the highest probability of over 80% reduction over the last three generations, 79 years, due to levels of exploitation. And taupe is assessed as critically endangered. So, if I'm reading that correctly, there's hope for the taupe. Well, maybe not. I mean, if I'm reading that correctly, like, it looks like in some parts of the world we have some some form of stability or recovery, but uh, the amount of decline has been dramatic. Um, and as far as the summary goes for the population trend, unfortunately, that's decreasing. Um, this is a new feature, by the way. I really appreciate IUCN Realist doing this. I think this emerged in the past couple of years, but um, it used to be just the species assessment, but I think two or three years ago, um, they added this uh, trend, uh, so that's a really handy feature. Um, population detail, current population trend decreasing, so we can go into that more in terms of why that's happening. So, um, the shy <laughs> I just I just saw the shy shark comments. Yeah, I, I think I think the shy shark probably is a good one for next week, so. <laughs> um, I, I think they're adorable. Um, let's see. So we got the six subpopulations of taupe shark. Northeast Atlantic, Southern Africa, th Southwest Atlantic, Northeast Pacific, Southeast Pacific, and Australasia. Okay. Uh, there's evidence of genetic similarity between the South American subpopulations. There's no evidence of mixing among the separate genetically distinct subpopulations. Okay. Let's talk about sources. Ooh, that's a lot of information. <laughs> um, yeah, I won't read the whole thing out loud. I'll just kind of scan through that. Oh, um, 
Likely taxonomic confusion between taupe and smoothhound, musculus, in some of the North Sea survey data. That's interesting, that some people have confused this species with other smoothhounds. That's very interesting. It's like a summary. Oh, well, sorry, I shouldn't, shouldn't go too too far. Okay. Across the regions with analyzed subpopulation and stock trends, taupe was estimated to have steeply declined in the southwest Atlantic, southern Africa, Australia, and to a lesser extent in the northeast Atlantic and New Zealand. All these subpopulations and stocks, with the exception of New Zealand, are estimated to have the highest probability to have undergone a reduction of greater than 80% over three generation lengths, uh, 79 years. In New Zealand, the stock is estimated to have undergone a reduction of 30 to 49% over three generation lengths, 79 years. Shout out to New Zealand, because that's not the first time we've seen that, where um, New Zealand, sharks in New Zealand seem to be relatively okay. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm wondering, I'm kind of curious if that maybe relates to, to, relates to New Zealand's um, geography, in a sense that New Zealand is largely not the most accessible place in the world as far as like, you know, multiple fishing, like, like multiple countries fishing, you know, it's, I mean, it's, I don't know, like, like, like it's, it, it, it's only neighbor is Australia, right? So I, I'm kind of curious if that is possibly a part of why New Zealand sharks tend to somewhat maybe be okay. I'm not really sure, but um, shout out to New Zealand because that's not the first time we've seen that New Zealand sharks are comparably doing better than um, the same species in like like but New Zealand shark stocks are comp are doing comparably better than um, shark stocks in other other countries so I, pre I appreciate that it's not the first time we've seen that so uh, the data quality used for the trend estimates varies from robust stock assessments in Australia and South Africa to standardized CPUE is catch per unit effort and I forget exactly what that is, so we should look that up. Because this, this is a really important unit. This is a very important unit for fisheries. So, in fisheries and conservation bio biology, the catch per unit effort, CPUE, is an indirect measure of the abundance of a target species. Changes in a catch per unit effort are... Okay, I forget. How do you calculate that again? Sorry. Da 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 da... A decreasing CPUE indicates overexploitation, while an unchanging CPUE ind indicates a su sustainable harvesting. Da, 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 da. How do you calculate it? Oh, formula. There you go. Okay, CPUE is calculated by dividing the catch of each fishing trip by the number of hours fished during that trip. This gives CPUE in units of kilograms per hour. Okay. I won't spend. I will. I will not spend a lot of time on this, but I'm just kind of curious. Oh my gosh! This this actually takes me back to undergrad. <laughs> like, I forgot about all this. Oh dear. Okay, so CPUE is calculated by dividing, I'll just say it again, is calculated by dividing the catch of each fishing trip by the number of hours fished during that trip. This gives CPUE in units of kilograms per hour. The median for every year is then calculated in order to remove outliers. Some fishers are more efficient than others. Okay. Okay. All right, I won't, I won't go into that more. But I, I just want to shout out to that because that is a very important concept as far as fishery science goes. Uh, CPUE is extremely important. So, um, okay. Where was I? Okay. Uh, the data quality used for the trend estimates varies from uh, robust stock assessments in Australia and South Africa 
to standardized CPUE in the Northeast Atlantic, none of the caveats above, and New Zealand, and nominal CPUE in the Southwest Atlantic. The CPUEs may not fully represent actual abundances, but are the best available data. In the Northeast Pacific, the subpopulation collapsed in the early 1940s, with no recovery until 1997 to 2004, I think we read that, when localized management led to localized increase in abundance. So thank you, people of the Northeast Pacific. Um, uh, yes. So. Mm -hmm. The consistent steepness of decline across most of the analyzed time series over the past three generation lengths, together with the lack of movement between the subpopulations, is cause for serious concern. So summarizing that, um, all all six oh, sorry, past three generations. Okay, all six subpopulations they don't really mix, so they're kind of isolated from each other, and each one for the most part, has experienced sharp decline. The New Zealand stock, not as sharp, but everybody else, um, all the other subpopulations have experienced really sh steep declines. So the de isolation in combination with the steep declines means this is in trouble. This is definitely critically endangered. That, that makes sense, so. Uh, the trend data were used for the estimation of global population trend, the estimated three generation length uh, subpopulation trend, for each region was weighted according to the relative size of each region. The overall estimated median reduction was 88%, the highest probability of an 80, over 80% reduction over three generation lengths, 79 years. So, it's not doing well. Um, I will say, again, this is the poster child, and we should look at conservation efforts, but this is the poster child for shark conservation um, as far as fisheries and over-exploitation goes. So, I'm very curious to read about conservation efforts uh, because this has been a very famous species. Um, so let's go into... There's a lot, actually. Let's go into that. Let me check, catch up with the comments. Do, 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 do. Oh, sorry. I don't know why that disappeared. Uh, basically, for every hour of fish, it gives you what you would catch. Thank you, Anya. Okay, awesome. Yeah, because it's like, um, it's so important. It, it's such an, uh, so for CPUE, thank, thank you for that. Because like, it is so important. And um, I just want to make sure I got that right. So thank you. So, And then Roy Roy, it does kind of look like a very average smooth house. So I can see how people can get it mixed up. Yes, I, I, I agree. Um, like, because I, I, like for us, like we're, we're all huge shark people. So we can, we can see those differences. You know, we kind of have, we... I think all of us have an eye for it now, which is really cool. Um, but like, you know, if you if you're not like attuned to like like if you're on a boat and you're not attuned to looking for those things, um, like those subtle differences, I could definitely see that happening where they're, where they're being mixed up. So um, yeah, so good so good good call on that as well. Okay, conservation. Here we go. There are some regulations in place for taupe. In 2020, taupe was listed on Appendix Two of the Convention of Migratory Species (SIMS) which obligates parties to work regionally towards conservation, specifically through the SIMS Memorandum of Understanding for Migratory Sharks. Um, I think I have SIMS... Yep, here we go. SIMS. So this is the SIMS website. We've never... I don't know if we've ever been on here before. Um, and... Is this like a little photo thing? Nope, it's not going to give me anything. Okay. Um... And it actually doesn't give me a summary of... Okay. Oh, it does give me a summary. Sorry. Okay. Um, at present, only few conservation measurements are present for taupe throughout its distribution range despite growing international awareness of common threats. Gear restrictions, mesh size limits, length-based restrictions, seasonal closures are in place in Australia and New Zealand. In the Southwest Atlantic, seasonal restrictions in an area with increased occurrence of gravid females, so pregnant females, are the only conservation measure. In South Africa, no conservation measures are in place at present. In the Eastern North Pacific, no species-specific management plans are in place, but gear restrictions are uh, also affecting taupe. Okay. Northeast Atlantic daily catch limits and gear restrictions are in place in the United Kingdom, and uh, European Union regulations prohibit the taking of taupe by long line over a large part of the northern European range. Range, sorry. So, okay. Let's go back to ICN. Oh, sorry. Uh, in Northeast Atlantic, European Union vessels are prohibited to land tote 
captured all long lines over a large part of its northern European range in International Council for the Exploration of Seas. Um, I've never heard of that, actually. ICES waters. Cool. Um, in the United Kingdom, since 2008, it has been prohibited to fish for taupe other than using rod and line. Okay. Um, in the Mediterranean, the General Fisheries Commission for the Mediterranean, this I've heard of, this, this is, that's kind of an important body in 2012, banned retention and mandated careful release for taupe and 23 other elasmarine species uh, listed on 